What's going on, it's the Rap Nerd, and I'm here today for a spoiler discussion slash review slash talk about Black Panther Wakanda Forever. If you have not seen the movie, press pause, go watch the movie, come back. You've been warned. After sitting on this movie for about two days, I really, really I like it. Borderline love it. I think Ryan Coogler did the best of a really tragic situation. I, again, like I said in my other review, he paid so much homage to Chadwick and T'Challa, and you feel his presence throughout the movie, but at the same time, the movie is definitely missing his presence as well. It's definitely a banger in the MCU. This keeps me hopeful, you know, in regards to Marvel and what they can do. Like, if they allow their directors to have most of the control of the film, we can get stuff like this. Like, this doesn't even feel like a typical Marvel movie. The humor in there, to me, is situational. I don't feel like anything was that forced, honestly. Most of the humor worked for me. And it was just a flat out good job, even the way the movie's colored. I don't even feel like Marvel films look like this movie as of late. The color grading here reminded me of what I saw in the first phase, like the really, really deep and rich blacks where they need to be, you know, shadowy and, and dark. I just thoroughly enjoy it. So I'm going to kind of go through the movie and just talk about my thoughts about it. Just get everything out there. It might be unconventional. It might be all, all over the place, but I'm just really excited to talk about this movie and I thoroughly enjoy it. Kudos to the crew. Ryan Coogler as the writer and director killed it, man. Honestly killed it. So one of the things that I didn't expect about the movie, the way it opens, you know, I knew there was going to be a funeral, but I didn't think that they were going to put us in the situation of T'Challa in, in the emergency room, you know, dying from some type of disease. And that shit right there totally wrecked me. I was in theater just crying like a, like a baby. You know? Like I, I literally couldn't even hold back. I was just, I had to look off just like tears flowing, just showing everybody in a panic and running around and you see Shorty, you know, trying to figure out a, a, a diagnosis, trying to make it with a heart-shaped heart -shaped plant to help in this disease that he caught and, you know, she's all, you know, like I said, frantically trying and then her mom just walks in calmly just, and then Shorty breaks down and man, and that's one thing about this film, the performances aren't so incredible because I feel like a lot of it's real. It comes from a real place, losing somebody, you know, that, 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 so close to like Chadwick, you know, those tears and that emotion was already there from the jump because let's face it, I, like when I watched like the, the, the interviews and everything, you know, promoting this movie, a lot of them, the actors involved, they kind of were just like in this weird space of not knowing how to feel because we're here to do a movie and we're here to, you know, celebrate this film and even Chadwick Boseman's passing, but it just feels so weird with him not being here and that just being an elephant in the room. So it just... A lot of a lot of the this, this stuff in here was I don't even think it was acting I think it was just real and how how a lot of the actors felt. You get to that situation when she just breaks down crying. I broke down crying. You get to the funeral and the way they just send it off. There's a casket with the arms of Black Panther. The engagement, you know, they do that. And it was just really really rough. And then when the credits start coming up, the Marvel Studios and it's just all Chadwick Boseman and it's just silent. Oh my God, like my heart. You know, I just man, that that hit me. In, in, in such a different way, as I've discussed before. You get into the film, and one of the things that I love, the first sequence, you know, they show Queen Ramonda, she walks into, you know, to a UN meeting, and the UN is kind of like, trying to question her as to why Wakanda hasn't been helping out the rest of the countries in, you know, around the world. You know, saying like, your, your outreach isn't doing its best job, and you, you, you kind of put a lockdown on vibranium, and you're not helping. And again, the way it's framed, it makes it seem like, you know, Queen Ramonda is going to respond in a kind of damaged slash fragile manner. Like she's just sitting there looking at him. And I'm, I'm thinking she's going to be like, well, you know, we were still, you know, mourning our king and we're trying our best to, 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 to help everybody out. But we will do better. I'm thinking it's going that going to go in that direction. And I just love how the way the scenes are edited in right here, like it they, like when the UN are addressing her, you know, she's talking and it shows a scene of like these people breaking in, trying to steal some vibranium from this base. And she goes, she just starts talking I'm like, see what you don't, you know, what y'all don't know is we're not weak. We don't play that shit. And as they go, you know, these robbers, this door opens and, and you know, they're told the vibranium is in there and out from the shadows walks Akoye and the rest of the door Malaja. And I was just like, ooh. <laughs> and that's when the monologue, I'm getting chills thinking about it now. That scene was, oh my God, that scene was so good. And then um, 
Queen Ramonda re- continues her monologue just explaining like it's not that we're weak and you know we choose and not to it's that we don't trust y'all you know ever since our king passed away there have been more attempts at breaking into these reach out points to steal the vibranium and what y'all don't realize is we're overly prepared and we don't play that shit pretty much and, and then I love how Queen Ramonda is like we'll help you doors of the UN open Dor Milaje walking with those robbers all chained up and she's like here are some of the people that try to break in and Okoye answers one of the you know I think I think the lady's f- f- French she's like you're welcome and it says it to her in French and all oh, it says the tone it just, it just I, I, I love that like you know seeing black women just handle that shit it's just amazing I love this movie it does that it's led by black women uh, Queen Ramonda Shorty Okoye um, Riri Williams you know they just run this shit and that's that's something that is understated a, a film led by black women like I get it it ain't all about that I'm not, I'm not trying to turn that leaf like oh it's all about that but it doesn't happen that often in, in action movies specifically you know and we talk about even more specific genre with comic book movies so I really love that that's how she played the game and was like we ain't we ain't soft just, just cause we you know we lost our king we still here like we still holding it down so I love that aspect and then you know from that point we move on to another base we don't know anything about it we just see some navy seals and it's night time and the introduction to the Talokin people, if I'm saying that wrong, excuse me, but that's that's how I remember it being said, it was something out of a horror movie, and it makes me want to see Ryan Coogler direct a horror film. Like, it was so eerie. The, the shot pans to the water, and you see just some heads kind of pop out, and they're all in like this little triangle, triangle type shape, and you just see them looking, and then this harmonizing starts playing, like, and at first I didn't know if that was the score or what, but there was a, some shot of somebody listening, like, what, what the hell is that? And then you see his man behind him. He does this, like, real subtle acting with his body. Like, he kind of is like, and I'm looking like, is he about to die? And he ended up just walking and jumping right into the river. And then the harmonizer just kept coming and pumping and pumping up. And it, it, it was some pretty terrifying shit, man. It, it, it was terrifying, especially when one of the guys walked up. About to, jump, about to jump into the water and he stops. He turns around and one of the Talokin people just snatches him down. Like, excellent introduction. Then they try to fly away and that's when Nemoa grabs that thing and spins that shit around, throws it. And I love the shot that it's just, Namor is just like standing there hovering and the camera's just on him and you see the moon behind him. Ooh! Love shots like that. Such a good shot. I love the whole political warfare of this film. I love the many pieces that play with Wakanda, Talokan, and, and you know America. Just it's this this it's this engaging. It's almost like a political thriller with just comic book characters involved in it, and I and I I really enjoy that. I even love the part when we first really really meet Namor, and he he kind of shows up in Wakanda, and it's so nonchalant. But when Shruti and Queen Ramonda are, you know, are talking, you know, by the beach, and he just casually just shows up, and he's looking around like, wow. Not even like like it's something about him doing that that's that's that, that's so terrifying to me because you're in a place you don't know, surrounded by what you know of being Wakandans, and you know the reputation of the Wakandans. But here you are just walking just like, wow, the stories are true. It's so clean, clear. You don't give a damn who's there. And he just has this calm, dangerous nature about him that is like eerily frightening. Easily one of the best MCU villains, period. Like he's up there with Killmonger, Thanos, Loki, easily. One film. He just demands so much attention. He demands so much of the screen. He demands so much of your your eyes and your ears every time he's on screen. And I just love it how he he is talking to the queen and Shruti with that same calm danger. You know, they got spears torn, you know, and weapons, you know, turned towards him. And he's just there like, look, I just want to propose something. That's it. Use the shell to call to me and I'll come up and we can talk about the decision being made. And, you know, he speaks about the machine that, you know, Riri Williams made. And he leaves and they turn and see the machine there and they're just kind of like, what the fuck? Because 
at this point, Wakanda hasn't been threatened by anybody. Like, nobody's been able to break in. Like, you know, and Thanos and them couldn't even break in. So it's just like, how was he and the group of people able to, you know, come in here? Did they go back to the drawing board and, and talk about what to do? And this, this when it comes to political warfare, it's like, well, who made this thing? Like, who has this type of tech? I mean, this is like Tony Stark level tech to make a, a machine that can identify where vibranium is. And... The vibranium aspect, I really love how pieces of that fell down in Tallow Can 2, and that's, that's what powered their city, just underwater. And what Ryan Cooler did here was so smart. Like, I saw a tweet that said this earlier. It was like, the movie's based around two minorities, ancient civilizations being built and wanting to stay to themselves and not be bothered by the colonizers. You know, during Namor's story, he expresses that. Like, he expresses why he became the person he is. How he became the person he is because of the colonization from the Spaniards. He said that. And in the first movie, Wakanda went through the same thing. So I, I love the bridging of the gap to show them that, like, we're one and the same. We want the same things. It's just one side wants to open the arms to, 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 to make form an alliance so that, you know, to, to keep things safe. While the other one is like, fuck all of them. Let's kill them all. And let's just, us live here. So, love that idea. Like, with the machinery and then being able to, to weave Riri Williams to be attached to it. I think that was really smart. And it, and it, it really flowed well. It didn't, it, it didn't feel forced. Like, it would make sense as to why such a thing was being made. Uh, and I love when they go to see her. And, of course, they find out that she is, is a genius, even at, at 19 years old. You know, they find her at college and goes in the pursuit of the car chase, which I thought was pretty dope. Don't think it's as good as the, 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 the last one in Black Panther, but the dope thing about it is that car chase leads into one of the best action scenes of the film when Okoye takes on the Talokan people and she's just going to work. Like That scene right there really, in my opinion, highlighted how skilled, how powerful Okoye is within the Black Panther universe and the Marvel Cinematic Universe because she was able to bang with all of them. And, and essentially, she defeated all of them on her own. They just came back to life. They were Wakandans. They had their own technology. They've seen everything. But when those water bombs came out, and even when, them, you know, when the, the Talican people first arrived jumping off those whales, she was kind of like, what the fuck? I thought I saw it all. But this is a whole different thing. And it goes to the water bombs I was talking about, you know, throwing it and, and she not really understanding what it is and being blown into the water. Dope scene. And the thing about that, the way that action was handled is there's no music there. So it just lets, allows you to focus on what you're seeing and what you're hearing. And it, it just makes it such a, you know, that much more of a visceral experience when you just focus on that. There's no music to carry you or any of that. Great directorial choice. Great choice. Another cool thing that I like is the glimpses of Shorty, you know, becoming the leader of the nation. They came to kill Riri. Shruti's like, no, 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 just take me to, take, take me to Namor, just take me to him and we can talk. And that's, that's something that, like like I said, like they, they, the rulers of the nation do. They don't just want to go after all out war and just killing people. And if they don't have to, let's talk about this peacefully and see if we can come to some type of agreement. And you see those flashes and instances with Shruti throughout the film, just trying to be more diplomatic, knowing that she has to step into these shoes you know, because of the unfortunate passing of her brother. Circle back to when they first meet Namor, and I just really like how he introduces himself. You know, he says, my people call me Kalkukulkan, but my enemies call me Namor. Such good writing, such good writing. Ryan just destroyed this. So, like I said, fast forward back to Shirley being noble. She goes down to, um, Talokan and she has this discussion with Namor and I just really enjoy how Namor shows her how you know, Talokan is and I like the differences in how it looks in comparison to Atlantis. Like I said in my other review, Atlantis is very high techy. You can tell that they utilize the resources underwater to make this futuristic type, you know, science fiction world. Well, well, Talokan is Talokan is pretty much just an ancient civilization. They still have the same properties. They still use the same type of things. They still wear the same type of garb. And it's just like the civilizations of the Mayans just flipped to, to be underwater. 
And I think that that was such a dope way to do it, to differentiate itself. Even the color palette of the underwater sea, it's not at all as bright and vibrant as you see in Aquaman. And that was the one thing I feared. I was like, how are they gonna do this? Because Aquaman did it so well, what are they gonna do to make it look different? And I didn't expect them to go the more minimalistic route and it just works because of the, the, the you know the people it's about the indigenous people there and like ryan just did his due diligence man when it comes to the lore and the way he depicted the talican people when i think that's what ryan coogler set out to do he did his homework even even i love how he makes the, the native people speak to each other in their tongue and not just automatically speak english like there's so many subtitles and the way they differentiate the languages in here just makes it feel much wider scope you know the, the wakandans speak and their subtitles are in yellow spanish is spoken in i think i believe it's white in the mayan language i think i think they speak the, the mayan language is what they speak from if i'm if i'm incorrect sorry and i don't mean to disrespect by it but it's spoken in blue and i love how they display that later on that I'll get into, but I just love that the, how international and worldwide they made this movie just by something as simple as that, you know, instead of making us just speak English. You know, should he sees this world and, and, and Namor is just, you see, see how he's perceived as his people and do like this when he comes to him and you just see the praise and the leader that he is and it's just so fucking good, oh my God. So they go through all of that and then they actually have to sit down to speak about what Namor wants to do and he's just like, now you see why my people are who I who they are. You know, he even goes through his bio and how he became Namor and all of that. But he, he at that moment, you, you empathize with him. You understand him perfectly as to why he wants to do this thing. You know, he feels the surface has, they just keep taking and taking and taking. And even talks to her like, that's why your people have bordered yourself against the other world. So they, they can't come in here. That's what we want to do. And I feel like the best way to do it is kill him. And even better, he references something that he said, you know, that Shuddy said to her mom, like, I want to burn the world down. And he's like, you know, I heard you say that. You want to burn the world down. Well, I can do it with you. Let's do it together. And it's such, such good writing. And of course, the diplomatic person in Shuddy, she's just like, I, I just can't do that, though. Like, there's, I was speaking out of anger. There's better solutions to getting this done than you killing Riri, which is, why well, no more? He wants to kill Riri because she made that machine to find vibranium, and you know he fears her making it again to help other countries come down there to take the vibranium. So he's like, I want to kill Riri Williams. So he's saying like, look, if I don't kill Riri, you we have to you know combine to attack the surface. And of course, Shuri's not with that shit. She ain't with it. She's like, I'm not, we're not about to. You, you're not. I'm not gonna let you kill this girl for one. And attack the surface world doesn't make sense. And pretty much says that, and that's when. He tries to lock her away, and that's when we get introduced to Nakia, her being a spy. Like, they do it so well, man. Like, she was introduced as this super spy in the first movie, but we never really get a glimpse or look at that. But here, she does it. And back to what I was saying about the subtitles, you know, she goes down to, to the beach where, you know, where Namor's people are, where you know, the ancient Mayans were, and she's speaking to people in Spanish, like, hey, I'm trying to find this, da, 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 da. and people are just kind of blowing her off. And he goes, she finds this one lady who keeps blowing her off and blowing her off. And then she starts speaking the Mayan language. You see the subtitles change to blue. And that's when the lady's kind of like, oh shit, you know of our lore. And that's when they have a discussion. And, you know, Nakia goes down there to break them out, you know, Riri and Shuri out. And while doing so, Nakia kills one of the, the Talican people. And Shuri's like, look, we have to save her because if she dies, this is gonna start a war between us and the Talokin. Like, we have to save her. But of course, the urgency, you know, they can't, and she ends up dying. And that's when shit just really, really, really hits the fan. It's one of those war things. You take one of mine, I'm gonna take 20 of yours. And boy, oh boy, does it get spooky. I love the sequence when they're about to go to war and Namor is giving that speech. He kind of, you know, flies down swims down, floats down, however you want to say it, sits in his throne with that ancient feathers garb on his head, the helmet, and he has a spear, and he's just talking to his people in his native tongue. That's what made it more. <clears throat> That's what made it hit more, is him speaking to them in their language. And he's yelling it, you see the subtitles, and it's just like, here it just felt so much more meaningful 
with Namor's background, his people, talking to his people in his language, saying that, look, they killed one of ours. We're taking lives. So, cuts to the next scene of, in Wakanda. Everybody's all happy. Shuri's back and Reeve's there and they talking about all this other stuff. And Shuri's kind of like, look, we killed one of their men. They're going to come for us. And in no time, that the attack that they put on Wakanda was so epic. So, <laughs> the way that they infiltrate with the water and it's, they just kind of flood the city and nobody really knows what's going on. And I love that Mbaku and his people are there and they're thinking that they got this shit figured out, knocking people away. But then when Namor shows up, the tables completely turn. Like the way he punched Mbaku, and I love how it was filmed, that would slow down and it showed his armor crushing and he just got sent a hundred yards. It's like, oh, we in trouble. But then Namor proceeds to just terrorize Wakanda on his own. On his own. It's like his people was there just to kind of help out and keep you know the troops busy, but Namor was uh, just on some shit. And the fact that he teases to attack his mom is crazy. And I'm, I gotta backpedal a little bit, I forgot why it made it so personal. Because there was this whole scheme that, you know, the Queen of Ramonda really, Queen Ramonda pretty much puts in place. Like, look, I'm gonna call Namor up here to allow y'all to break in and get them out. And, you know, she calls Namor up just and, and tell, telling her like, look, you can't have the girl. Like, we're not gonna do that. And I just love that scene, Namor walks up to her, like, just not even looking at her. He's just like, if you push me, we will kill you. I have no problem with that. And it's just so, it really, it's just so calmly terrifying for him to say that to the queen. Ooh, give me chills, man. He, he fucking killed it. What is his name? I gotta find his name. Cause I don't want to disrespect my guy like that. Do not, he, he just destroyed this shit, honestly. Like every man, every facial expression, his, his body expression, just how calm he was, how he did not play at all, killed it. But like I said, so that's her, and then that's what really gets him going. Is like he feels like he was betrayed and, and he was made a fool of. So for him to come back and re and repay that debt, and him not to fuck around, like he went up to Queen Ramonda, threw a spear at him, at her through the glass, and was just looking like, okay, water bombs, throws it, blowing up the whole top of the building and drowning her, killing the queen, like. That gets a whole different level of dominoes falling just from her dying and now it's like up to shooty she's the last left and man it's just so that's another emotional gut punch is that like the mother passed and now you gotta carry that but again shooty being a genius and this is what we see in comic books she's, she's become black panther she goes back and starts working on the suit and creates another heart-shaped herb takes it and the, the surprise when she goes to the ancestral ground she sees Killmonger and I thought that that was a very interesting choice to make which is to me still something that hasn't 100% been figured out why she saw him you know I think it was because I feel like how she was feeling at the time just being so rage filled that Killmonger was the one that speak to her like look your daddy was a coward you know your daddy was a hypocrite I forgot what he said about his mother but he's like, your brother was noble, but he didn't want to get anything done. Now, who are you going to be like your brother or me and get shit done? And of course, she comes back and I really like that she even gets a suit that's similar to Killmonger. Like, I think that that, that says a lot. Like, it shows that she has some growing to do and some pain to, to get over in order to get to a place where she can actually be the definitive Black Panther that we that we've seen, you know. So I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And as she dropped down, as the rest of the Wakandans were speaking about how to attack, you know, Namor, because he said he was coming back, and they're just kind of in awe, like, what, what, what do we need to do, bro? And she drops down there, presenting herself as the new Black Panther. And I like when she talks to Mbaku, that she's like, I'm gonna kill him. I'm gonna kill him. Fuck it. 
And Mbaku is the one, the voice of reason. He's just there like, look, they call this man Kalkukong. Or if I butcher that, my bad. But he's not just some king. He's a god to them. Do you realize that if you kill him, this could possibly mean an end to the world. The domino blocks are going to keep falling. Like, if you kill him, they will never forgive you and they will never forgive us. And we're going to start a battle that can that can continue and go so far that this world will pay the price for it. And I don't think you want to do that. And I don't want to see that for you because that ain't what your people is about. I love that line. Oh, my God, I love that. I love that. That's when they develop a plan about how they're going to you know, capture Namor. And this part for me is when the movie gets a little bit eh, eh, eh. like the first two acts I, I fucking love. I love all this, these politics and all this, this lore and this mythology and this technology and civilization talk. I love all of that. But the third act for me is, is a little bit shaky. And it's kind of like Black Panther 1 where I had the issues too. You know, their plan, you know, to draw Namor out. I like that, you know, it's a big boat. We're gonna go to his hometown and recreate this weapon slash sonar that he wants to destroy and we know for a fact that he's going to come directly to that but at least if he comes to us we can do the playing ground but my thing about that is it's like i don't really know if you would want to fight people of the water on top of water knowing that they get the power from the water to me that didn't make much much sense but i get what they were doing they just wanted to make it to be like a, a bait and switch and you know in a sense to, to bring namor out so they can capture him and fly him away so i get that aspect of it but it was a little bit like I think it, it might have been better a little somewhere else. And honestly, the whole third act battle, in my opinion, kind of draws it out some. And it, it suffers from the same problems as the first Black Panther. You know, the VFX are a bit eh in this one. You know, especially with it being broad day, it just doesn't look that real. There's so much going on that you can't really focus or feel much of anything. And I think it, it has to do with the editing. Like, I feel like Marvel may handle this battle part because I just... Like I said, it's just so much going on. You got Riri Williams flying around doing stuff. And, you know, Okoye shows up with this suit that I don't really like the design of at all. You have the tallow cans running around. And it's just a lot. And, and you never really feel it because you're not with anybody long enough. Like, the way the edits happen, it's just a bunch of random shit going on. Like, it, it doesn't flow miraculously in the same way as we saw in Infinity War. How... We're cutting to do two different planets here, seeing different people fight, but we still get a sense of focus on the action. But in that particular battle, it's just it's just too much. The tangible quality, I think that might be what it is too, because in Black Panther 2, the lack of tangible anything in that scene just makes it feel like you're just watching some shit. And you have, like I said, a Koye with the metal suit and it doesn't look real. The, the green screen doesn't look that good either. Other Wakandans, it's just a lot of, of, of CGI going on so you, you don't have a tangible aspect to it. To me, that, that third act battle was a mess. I don't want to harp on it, but I was just kind of watching like, we spent this whole time, these first two acts, feeling so real, feeling so tangible. Even Talokan being underwater, felt like a real place that, that it, the way it looked the color of it i feel like they actually filmed the people who were in the water underwater and you could see that they were underwater but it just made it feel a lot better and real you know what i'm saying it's hard to explain but and then the third act just kind of does away with all of that you know that's why i didn't really care for it that's why i'm like i wish it would have been kept more intimate to keep that realistic nature like we saw in the other two acts and i think black panther one suffered from the same thing in my opinion so but i do like the standoff fight between shorty and namor that was cool you know i like the idea of evaporated the water off his body as machines to do it to weaken him so when they got him to the desert it was more of an even fight between the two of them but their fight was brutal it felt like watching Spider-Man versus Green Goblin for Spider-Man, how how much, you know, the brutality it was, you know. Namor landing really hard hits. Shruti landing hard hits. I mean, when she when he stabbed Shruti, you know, right between, you know, in the stomach, I was just like, no way she's going to die. Is this going to happen? Gets out of it, and she's able to give him the smoke back, pretty much almost blow him up and put him in a position where he could die. But that's when she kind of snaps back out of it with her mom like show him who you are you know you don't have to do this and you know she has the blade to him like look i don't want to have to kill you we can work something out 
yield and bygones will be bygones. You don't gotta like us, and we don't have to like y'all, but we should be able to coexist. And I will do my best to align with the surface to leave you guys alone. Because they still don't know who you are. And I, I just found it so noble. And one of the most powerful parts is, you know, when they finally go back to the scene together and they're telling each other, back off, this is it, return. And they kind of break away. And that was a big moment. And I love when that theme came back in. That dun, 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 I love the theme. Namor's theme was fucking ridiculous too. Oh, oh man, like the, all of the native instruments when we see his, him and his crew, fantastic. So I loved all of that. I love, I love the way it ended. I love that Shorty went to go see Nakia and we kind of got a, you know, a reboot of Black Panther in a sense. You know, I keep seeing the you know, recast T'Challa. They should have recast it, but I'm like, at the end of the movie, that's what they did. She revealed that they got a six-year-old son. So we easily could go 10 years into the future training this kid and he becomes the new Black Panther easily. So I'm like, we got what we wanted at the end of the movie. So all in all, I've been talking a long time. Thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I could even say I love it despite me having some gripes with the third act. And I've only seen it once. So maybe when I watch it a second time, knowing that that third act plays out the way it does, I may find some more appreciation in that because part of not liking it kind of was let down because I was like, why did they go this route again? They went the same route of big CGI battle, go big or go home, when they didn't have to do that. This is one of my favorite Marvel films, easily. I don't know where it's gonna land, but it's definitely top 15. Rest in peace, Chadwick Boseman. Shout out to Ryan for writing, directing, all the cast and the crew. Let me know what you think about Black Panther. What kind of forever did you like it? Did you love it? What's your favorite scenes? Who's your favorite characters? Be respectful in the comments as usual. And if you like this kind of content, make sure to like and subscribe. Until next time. Peace. Rap nerd productions, no capping, that's word to mommy.